Welcome to our 2017 Global Summit post-event webinar. I'm Helen King, your host. Earlier this month, Supply Chain Insights hosted our fifth annual Global Summit. Today, we will recap the event, what we saw, what we learned, how we imagined the supply chain of 2030, and how you can apply this knowledge to your business and implement change throughout your industry. Before I hand this over to Laura and the rest of the panel, there are a few things I want to cover with you. We're recording today's session, and we'll post it to our on-demand webinars page. You can visit our website to listen to this or any of our other webinars. Additionally, we'll send out the slides to all attendees within 24 hours of the broadcast. We encourage you to share these slides with others in your organization, and if you have questions, reach out to Laura or myself to set up a discussion. We want to hear your questions and ideas on this topic as well, so please post your questions to the Q&A function to the left of your screen. We've left time at the end of the webinar to address your questions. Finally, we will be live tweeting the webinar, so if you'd like to join the social media conversation, you can use the hashtag SCIWebinar during the event. Now, let me introduce your host, Laura Ciceri, founder of Supply Chain Insights. As an enterprise strategist, Laura focuses on the changing face of enterprise technology. Her research is designed for the early adapt adopter seeking first mover advantage. She comes to the stage with over 40 years of diverse supply chain experience. Welcome, Laura. Hey, thank you so much, Helen, and thank you for all your support on the Global Summit. Putting on a conference is certainly a lot of work for the team, and uh, you were great. And uh, also the panel that I have today was wonderful to work with. Uh, let me introduce the panel. When we do our webinars, we invite business leaders and technologists to join us on panel discussions. And the goal is to use our research as a backdrop to really drive a discussion. And to that end, I would love for people to put questions in the question chat box, and I'll facilitate the dialogue with Cindy and Ann. So Cindy, tell the group a little bit about yourself. Sure. Thanks, Laura. Um, I'm Cindy Hain. I'm Vice President of Logistics Product Management for Alimica. And we are the supply chain operating network for the process industries. And what that means is we provide automation, collaboration, and visibility solutions for our customers. Um, and how it relates to you know, the work that you do and, and why we're so interested in participating with your company is that we really can help our, com our customers develop touchless, procure to pay, and order to cash and logistics processes. So it really fits in with the digitization trends that, that we're talking about today. Awesome. And Ann, tell the group a little bit about yourself. Yeah, hello. This is Ann Adams. I am the Global Visibility Leader for Dow AgriSciences, which is now part of Dow DuPont. Um, Dow AgriSciences, we provide seeds and also crop protection chemicals to the agriculture market. And specifically my role, I'm working to um, really set the strategy for better visibility across the value chain. So how do we connect better from our suppliers to our customers and making sure people have data um, to make decisions faster. Thanks for having me, Laura. Well, awesome. So Cindy and Ann and I have prepped, and we're going to go through some slides, and then we're going to have some questions, and we're going to do some dialogue. So what we did was we picked our favorite slides from the conference, and we're just going to go through them, and then we're going to have Q&A, and we're going to have a chance for you to ask us questions. I know we have some people that have joined us from Russia and Australia late at night, and so we just really want to have a great discussion. So one of the things we did in preparation for the conference was we did a data mining project of uh, 450 different metrics across 1,400 companies. And we were trying to understand the correlations to market cap and looking at metrics within each of these silos of growth, profitability, cycles, complexity. And most of the research we've done at Supply Chain Insights has been on revenue, year-over-year -year revenue, profitability, operating margins, cycles, inventory, and complexity return on invested capital. And we found that 90% of companies are stuck really not making progress on a balanced portfolio. And one of the issues is most companies don't have a balanced portfolio because they are very focused on functional metrics. But we looked at about 150 different factors, and we tried to find out what the most important driver was for people to really improve market capitalization on the balanced portfolio. And we found it was talent. 
which was surprising to me because we tested things like, you know, how was the organization uh, structured and, uh, you know, did they have a common instance of ERP and what was the vendor of ERP and what consultant did they use? And so we looked uh, very analytically at lots of factors. And so talent, as we think about the evolution of uh, next generation supply chain processes, is I think both a barrier and it's an opportunity. And this engaged talent factor of learning next generation processes was one of the primary themes of the conference. Now, when you say next generation thinking, people will say, well, what does that mean? And I love the dialogue because I think so many times we throw terms out and we don't really define them. You know, we at Supply Chain Insights are working on the definition of outside-in processes, starting with the customer back. And in the training we do, every class I do, and I ask people to draw supply chains, when people pick up crayons, they always start with the suppliers and they start with a supplier, supplier logistics. But most people on supply chain don't know their customer, don't understand their customer, and the supply chains are largely untethered from the market. And as a result, they're not market sensing. They can't really see what's happening in the channel. And it's also about design of value networks. So, so often we don't design our value networks, we accept them. And we try to fine tune what we get. And so this whole area of design is really an important concept. And then looking at how different forms of data can be used in new forms of analytics. So whether it's real-time data, whether it's structured, non-structured data, or the use of open source technologies, which allow us to move data much more quickly and to be able to drive much more powerful analytics than what we've had before to really drive a sensing organization that can drive an intelligent response and the autonomous supply chain that can drive localized processes. This is really different than traditional supply chains that use transactional data with a batch-based process with an assumption that we'll build on ERP architectures and that will drive linear optimization. And the ironic thing is the supply chain is nonlinear. So we've been trying to do uh, optimization through linear optimization on a nonlinear system. So the conference was designed to help people to think differently and drive new outcomes. And one of the things we talked about, what does digital transformation mean for you? And in the research, we test, you know, does it mean the autonomous supply chain, which is really the automation of supply chain processes through advanced analytics, uh, reducing labor? Is it Uberization or social platform sharing? Is it 3D printing or additive manufacturing, Internet of Things, multi-tier networks, and redefinition of B2B and cloud-based computing? Most people will say digital, but they won't define it, and they won't really think about what does it mean holistically. And it's about time. It's about the redefinition of time, and it's about redefinition of processes. So the other thing we asked people to do was to think about Supply Chain 2030 and the technologies that would get us there. And where they're seeing a decrease in excitement for 2030 and where they see that things are really growing and momentum's gaining. So you can see that more passive forms of analytics, visualization, uh, big data pools and lakes, mobility, um, even demand sensing uh, are not as seen as important as we look at the future where we're looking at machine learning, cognitive computing, blockchain and hyperledger is the open source version of blockchain, autonomous vehicles, and robotics. And so the conference was all about the confluence of these technologies. So with that, let me ask Cindy and Anne to weigh in. Anne, what is a next generation process look like for you? And what did you learn at the conference on next generation that you can share? Sure. As I, as I think about this, you know, I kind of see as more data is moving faster, right? We have machine learning that people, you have more of an autonomous supply chain and that people might be spending more time doing other things than sitting in front of a computer, right? Maybe they're building uh, relationships with suppliers, with customers, and so forth. Um, also, specifically in ag, I can see maybe using more unstructured data to predict, like you said, sense that demand and maybe be able to predict when there's going to be a bug outbreak based on what you're seeing on the social media 
um, or even using weather data to help predict um, some of the demand needs on the, on the farmer side. So one structured data there would be weather? Would it be yield? Well, what would that structured data? Yeah, I'm even thinking the, the social media, right? The, the text um, discussions going on around the farmers talking about bug outbreaks or things that are happening in certain regions and things like that. Okay, great. Cindy, your thoughts? Uh, yeah, just to echo a few of the things that Ann said and add and build on that. Um, I look at next generation processes being uh, digitized and augmented. And I, I, I've added augmented to my definition just based on uh, what I heard at your conference, because I think it means uh, certainly kind of that human machine boundary and how we work with with machines. But I also look at it as because we have a as we add more digitization to our processes, we're going to create that really fast, data-rich pool, and we can create actual learning systems from that. So it's the, the augmented in that it's going to continue to learn and get better and provide us more and more valuable insights. So creating uh, knowledge workers where before, to, to Anne's point, point, we were maybe sitting in front of a computer or entering, entering data. Were there any surprises for you at the conference, Cindy or Ann? Well, once again, congratulations on such a, a content-rich uh, agenda. So it was, I was very impressed with uh, every one of the speakers, and I couldn't think of any that, uh, uh, you know, just maybe a few highlights here and there that were that were better than the others. But um, no, I, I think the um, I was I'm always impressed when people bring some of these innovative technologies, and I think you know just one standout is the the 3D printing. Uh, video that we saw and just some amazing things that we're going to be able to do and, and create products that, uh, that we couldn't create with any other manufacturing process. So that one was kind of exciting for me to see. Yeah. Yeah. I, and the format of the conference was nice in that you had a lot of different use cases, right? So we could actually think about how we might be able to apply some of these new technologies in, in our workspace as well. So. Good. Well, we have a question about blockchain, and I know both of you have been working with me on the network of networks, and we've been doing a lot of writing on blockchain. And you know, the question is, how do we see blockchain impacting supply chain? And you know, I, I love the idea of disintermediation. Uh, I love the idea of defining nodes, uh, redefining supply chain finance and lineage, uh, reducing onboarding. Cindy and Ann, I know you've been doing a lot of work with us in this area. How do you see blockchain uh, in the next generation process? I think that there's a great opportunity for you know product traceability using technologies like blockchain. Um, but I know as you've you, as we've discovered, there's still a ways to go. So we're I think needing to find some some use cases that are going to give us some good. Uh, experience in learning how and uh, how to use blockchain and how not to use blockchain. Um, just until and, and, and until some of the like particularly the security model of some of the uh, blockchain technologies is uh, improved a bit. Yeah, we found that uh, blockchain is more ready for one-to-many uh, networks than many-to-many -many networks, and so there's still a need for some security feature upgrades. Ann, any response to that? Um, I would agree. I think it's it's the big buzzword, right? You know, everyone wants to, to use blockchain in, in lots of different places, but I think it's finding the right use case where it provides value is still key. And if it was easy, it would be done already, right? So yeah. that's some of yeah. the challenges we're finding is that it's not as easy as we might think. Well, and, you know, blockchain's not new, right? It was, you know, what, uh, 15, 18 years old, so... Uh, so you're right. If it was as easy, then you know we'd be way into it. And also, we need to be careful we don't overhype it. So this was my favorite slide from the conference. This was a slide from uh, Gita Gopeth, who is an economist from Harvard. And this slide really spoke to me. And I just want to spend a minute on it. The slide plots vertical world trade intensity uh, on the vertical axis, and so you can see that. Uh, world trade intensity, which is world exports plus world imports and the relationship to the GDP. 
So this is what we're putting on water and air and across the boundaries. And I entered uh, the supply chain world in 1974, and at that point in time, you know, we had more of a regional supply chain. Uh, you know, I could, you know, send my products to regional areas, and over time, you know, we built global supply chains and global multinationals. And I think we talk about global, but the impact of all of the uh, intensity of managing exports, managing imports, and the relationship to GDP and the relationship to growth. One of the issues is I think many people uh, are not really in context with the post-growth rates of 1.1%. I often see people will overestimate their ability to grow in markets. And in the 1990s, we had kind of a you know, wonderful period where we had three times the growth rate and we were able to really drive a lot in globalization and new product launch that uh, we're not able to do at this point in time. We actually find in markets that people will overestimate growth in the first two quarters and then what will happen in the last two quarters, they'll try draconian methods to manage costs because they're not able to drive growth. So this is one of my slides that really spoke to me, and it spoke to me about complexity and economic uh, factors in the supply chain. The other speaker that I had was Robert Gordon, and Robert had wrote the book on American productivity, the rise and fall of American growth. And when I read Robert's book, I was shocked to find that the impact of the third industrial revolution, which is mobile phones and computers, actually stopped in 2004. And you know, I was a baby boomer and I got to see the benefit of the second industrial revolution and the impact and, um, you know, which was, you know, electric current and steam engines. And uh, I actually went through mobile phone and computers on everybody's desk. And before I read Robert's book, I thought that we had had tremendous impact on, you know, productivity through uh, computerization and in memory. And, you know, one of the things I wanted to do in the conference was understand what could we learn from the third industrial revolution that we could take forward as we think about the future uh, revolution that I think is going to happen through the confluence of new technologies. So, Ann and Cindy, your thoughts? Uh, what can we learn? Cindy? Yeah, so one of the things I remember from Robert Gordon's presentation is the kind of an explanation for why the third industrial revolution was shorter than the second. Um, and it had to do with the impact on our lives, right? So the third industrial re revolution really impacted the way we work, but didn't have a profound impact on the way we live. And, uh, uh, you know, th think, for example, the impact of running water versus the impact of Facebook, if you will. So kind of th that was the explanation that he gave for that. Um, and so it got me thinking, I'm, I'm curious to know uh, your opinions about this, but is the fact that some of the innovations we're talking about with the augmentation of labor and with further digitization creating insights that, that will allow us to use more critical thinking skills at work where before we were, you know, perhaps just, uh, again, entering data, do you think that that's going to have that profound impact that is going to allow us a sustained, you know, uh, growth phase? I think uh, the autonomous vehicle uh, definitely, Cindy. You know, if I look at some of the research now about cars as a social environment that, you know, we have parties and cars and conference calls and cars and, you know, the car mm -hmm. is a, you know, redefinition on autonomous vehicles. Uh, I think so. I think autonomous vehicles, as we think about trucking and, you know, the ability to have uh, people in the cab that aren't driving the truck, but, you know, really just kind of there as kind of autopilot. So I think that we're entering that phase, and particularly in autonomous vehicles, and perhaps in uh, prescriptive analytics and cognitive computing as we look at, you know, exception management and voice recognition. Uh, you know, we've got Siri and Alexa uh, for voice recognition. And your thoughts? Well, and to continue your discussion, I think we really need to start to think about how our business models need to change. Right, how we've done work in the past may not be the, the business model we need in the future. If you think about the autonomous vehicles and, 
and um, you know, you've got Uber that's playing in that space as well as Ford, and I bet Ford did not realize Uber was going to be their largest competitor. In that exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. Good mm -hmm. point. And I think Ford didn't realize that Google was going to be a large competitor as well. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, there was one other point, though, that I wanted to, to make, just to not to forget one of the key premises of uh, Robert's research, and that is that, um, you know, his point, one of his points is that we're not sure you're going to be able to innovate out of these, what he calls these four headwinds. Um, they were demographics, education, debt, and inequality. So until we can you know, resolve some of these big issues uh, with regard to those four factors, you know, he was predicting that it would be, um, it, we're, we're not going to be able to innovate our way past you know, greater than about 1% growth. And Gita talked about the lack of um, investment, overall investment, that mm -hmm. more people were holding money. And so uh, I think those headwinds uh, are pretty big headwinds. Uh, but you know, then we have some startups that kind of help us with the way, whether they're Tesla or Google or Uber and the um, redefinition with Amazon. We have a question, uh, how many people have uh, been working on cognitive computing? Our research shows about 7% of companies, but uh, machine learning and cognitive computing, Yash, are really being done at the edge. Uh, they're either being looked at as replacement of master data management for like supply chain planning data or they're being used uh, to augment certain models. Uh, we haven't really seen the full replacement and redefinition of decision support yet. And by decision support, revenue management, supply chain planning. Um, Joe asks, what do I think the most important limiting factor is relative to digital progress? And I think it's uh, our belief we have best practices, Joe, and our ability to manage ourselves. Uh, I think that there's a tremendous sucking sound in the industry for consultants that have best practices and technologists that want to sell yesterday's technology. And that maintains you know, most of the advertising, most of the intellectual property that you see you know, in the mainstream conferences, et cetera. So we have so much pull towards tradition that uh, you know, it's hard for our gray matter to wrap our heads around another way of thinking. Anne and Cindy, any comments on those two points? None for me. Okay, Anne? Mm, no. Okay. For me. Uh, Francisco says how we visualize the evolution of an organization uh, with SNOP and demand driven uh, will it become obsolete with AI and other technologies. Uh, you know, I think that just like we have um, ATM machines, but we still have bank tellers. Uh, the process won't become obsolete, but it will become far more insightful. I think our ability to get data and drive insights will be far greater and will blow up all our Excel ghettos because most people are using Excel for supply chain planning, not really the tools that we implemented. So, uh, But I think that you know I've written a lot of posts about how planning changes, and I think that it will be voice activated versus a screen will come in in the morning and we'll say, you know, Siri or Alexa, what happened last night, and they'll tell us what happened and how that compares to the SNOP plan and what we need to do and uh, where the issues are, and we'll tell it what to do tonight while we go to bed. And I think the job will be many uh, steps easier, fewer people, uh, more insightful. Well, one of the other presentations I dearly loved was the Carter's presentation. And Carter was um, a supply chain to admire winner in 2016. So we asked Peter to come and talk about his secret sauce. And Peter wasn't willing to share all of the secret sauce, but he talked about complexity. And this is a case study that uh, I just dearly love because I think a lot of times people talk about complexity, but they don't really act. And this is a rendition of the Carter supply chain, which is a child's clothing supply chain, and the relative complexity. And you know, on a physical standpoint, you know, he's got you know, 765 million units and 24,000 plus styles and 300,000 plus SKUs and uh, all of them tied to uh, complexity. And what they worked on was redesigning the supply chain to be able to look at 
postponement, which I think most people don't think enough about postponement and supply chain by design, and how do they tie design and postponement and form and function of inventory to supply chain strategy. They did a definition of DIM codes, which I'll show you, which is a way of doing attribute-based, uh, rules-based logic. Uh, and most people operate at a SKU level, and the SKU doesn't really carry information to drive rules. And so his DIM codes are things like packouts and customers, uh, and then to work on work and process reservations. And one of the interesting things to me about Peter's presentation was the fact that you know it was not about coal and neat new technologies. It was really about using his current technologies better. And he questioned the status quo and really looked at postponement strategies throughout the life cycle. And you can see that you know where he's got life cycle issues, he's really trying to implement postponement through the full life cycle. This is a great case study, I think, of people thinking about late stage decisions and postponement and uh, you know why it matters, and then to think about uh, how to use our numbering systems to be able to give us uh, insights for rules. So his DIM codes carry you know, the pack outside, the channel, channel, customer presentation, markets, and this is a form of attribute. And as we think about attribute-based planning, attribute-based rules, uh, particularly when we get into cognitive computing and we can have many-to-many -many rule sets, our ability to do attribute-based logic increases. And one of the things I think that many people don't think about in digital transformation is it gives us the opportunity to redesign for simplification. Our supply chains have become pretty complex. Now another case study I loved was Peggy Gulick. And Peggy stood on stage and, you know, commanded attention. She worked on a wearable uh, implementation, and it started with, you know, the people at Agco, which they make heavy industrial equipment, uh, were breaking all their tablets uh, on the production floor too quickly. And you know, instead of a stick, you know, where many people would say, "Don't break tablets," or "I'm going to charge you X amount for breaking tablets," she really built workforce productivity to bring the users in and to test uh, the concept of wearables, whether it was wearable glasses, wearable watches, uh, and uh, you know, use the Internet of Things to really redefine her factory floor. So you know, she has uh, Wi-Fi enabled wrenches and uh, you know, barcode scanning along with watches and uh, the ability to have voice activation and uh, all of her uh, employees wear wearable glasses so that allow them to see orders and shipments and get status. And so when they walk around the factory floor where they're building these heavy pieces of equipment, uh, it's connected with Internet of Things and wearable devices. Fascinating case study. And uh, I'd encourage you to see this on YouTube. All of our presentations are now posted on YouTube. Another case study that I thought was extremely useful was the Jabil case study where Jabil has defined value maps and workflows to be able to look at outside in processes and the redefinition of digital. And they have built uh, a visual control tower which allows them to be able to work on advanced analytics, visibility, and orchestration. And the term orchestration, which is really bi-directional flows looking at price and value, is something I don't think we've thought enough about. And um, they've done some good work both on their control tower, 3D printing, Internet of Things, and a lot of this is very customized work. And they've got a digital team. And the reason why I selected Jabil is they're one of the few case studies that I've seen that actually has defined digital transformation. And then we had a presentation on 3D printing. This was uh, Mitch Free from Fast Radius, and he's redefined service parts through 3D printing, uh, looking at uh, how he can use UPS to basically 3D print and then move the parts to UPS for distribution. And the interesting thing to me about Mitch's presentation, and Mitch is you know, a machinist by trade uh, has come up through the spare parts industry, uh, CNC machinery, and you know, he just says that we're ready for exponential growth, that we have been 
you know, slow mo uh, as we've let the machines develop, and now you know they're really ready for prime time. So, okay, Cindy and Ann, now how do you drive a digital transformation? You know, when you think about Peggy and Jabel and Carter's and all the case studies, what's your takeaway? And how do you, how do people get started to really drive the organizational digital transformation? Ann, let's start with you. Yeah, I thought these use cases were very interesting, each you know quite different. But um, what was common that I saw out of those was that they started with a problem, right? They had an issue. The the Agco company that had were breaking the tablets on the floor, right? They they looked for then new opportunities and, and new ways to change it, and they got outside the box, right? So they got outside what they would normally be doing. They didn't jump into well, let's look at the technology first, right? So they started with what's the problem, and then outside the box to find solutions. I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah. And I mean, uh, Cindy, your thoughts? Yeah, that was that was exactly going to be my first point that they set out initially to solve a problem. Um, the thing about the ICO case study too that I that I took note of is that um, you know once they did solve the problem, a side effect was all of this data. And so they were able to turn those that data into insights and so it, it just accelerate the innovation just accelerates um, and you know you provide more and more uh, value to the organization. Um, I do want to point out something that Peter said from Carter's, um, which I thought was very good advice, and it was about his technology strategy. And he mentioned that he starts with, or he considers his ERP to be the process or the system for the dumb transactions. And he has created, and by partnering with you know very agile technology providers, he has created you know very um, uh, innovative and 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 probably custom solutions for them so that he can support the agility that he needs in his supply chain because of his postponement strategy. So I really like that, the ERP being for done transactions and then other technologies that, uh, that are quite agile in the way that they can be developed can be added, uh, you know, can add the value to the, to the rest of it. Um, and then there was one comment from John at Jabel that I wrote down that I've, that I've said before, but I didn't have a good statistic for it. And he said that more than 80% of network activity resides outside of the four walls of an organization. So just that idea that your supply chain exists outside of your four walls. And so how do you, how can you use technologies to tap into your, that ecosystem of trading partners and, and collaborate better with them? Yeah, I yep. would add also and that I, we spend a lot of time, sorry, doing continuous improvement, right, of our process. Us, right? How do we get better at what we do today, and, and not really embracing the, the different thinking and getting outside the box? Right. Well, one of the things about the case studies I enjoyed was the fact that they were very talent-centered, uh, very focused on people, um, and I think uh, sometimes people focus on technologies for the sake of technologies. You know, the day before uh, we started the conference, I had a couple of people that brought me their supply chain strategies to review. And I remember looking at them, and it was like Internet of Things or it was visibility, and it wasn't about people. And, you know, one of the things that stood out for me at this conference was not only the initial research that we did that was about talent, but also the talent uh, implications of the digital transformation. And we had a talent panel on Wednesday, and we shared some of the results that we had on the work we had done uh, earlier in the year. And we had 600 uh, respondents on this, and we were looking at relative satisfaction. And uh, baby boomers, by and large, are the most satisfied today, and Gen X and millennials are not as satisfied. And I think one of the issues is we don't give uh, voice to millennials and Gen X to the same way. I think the baby boomers tend to be pretty heavy handed about, you know, best practices and we know, you know, how to drive continuous improvement. And they've had more opportunity. We went through the uh, golden years of the 1990s. But the other thing that I found interesting is that the vendors and academics are far more satisfied than the business user and user community. And I think as we've gone through a lot more mergers and acquisitions, uh, there's been less uh, opportunity for us to build talent and more turnover of talent and uh, more disruption of talent. And uh, 
I think we can all feel that. And, you know, when people can work, you know, remotely uh, or have shared personal time, then they have better work-life balance and they're more satisfied. And this was, uh, you know, 600 people and we have the opportunity. We're doing some uh, employee benchmarking right now. If anybody wants to benchmark their uh, current supply chain to low relative satisfaction, let us know. The other thing that we uh, talked about was the shortage of talent in the middle management area. While we have a lot of focus on uh, employees coming out of school or uh, what we call fast track employees, but the biggest area is in this middle management, the senior managers, the directors, um, and you know programs for them and uh, programs to really stimulate next generation thinking. And uh, the panel really talked about, you know, to build these next generation processes and build this mid-management talent. It isn't a big bus of consultants. It's really, uh, you know, like Peggy or Peter and really focusing on the people, focusing on next generation supply chain thinking, focusing on a business problem and finding employees with the right skills and experience and helping them to solve problems. And, you know, to me, this conference was all about talent. It was like, you know, how do we build next generation supply chain talent? Uh, how do we maximize the learning? How do we help people to ideate around the journey and then drive it? Cindy, your thoughts, how do we build next generation supply chain talent? So one of the things I always look for in employees, and I think this is going to be even more important, um, because, you know, as you said earlier, supply chains are very complex, nonlinear systems. Um, and that, that talent is, um, a couple of things. The ability to model a problem, right? So the ability to, to represent a real world, world problem in a way that allows uh, uh, you or technology to solve it. So kind of, you know, weeding through all of that complexity and getting to a to, to something that, that is, is actually solvable. And I think part of what that requires is just an intellectual curiosity. So Modeling capabilities and intellectual curiosity, those are the things that, that I look for for employees and that I think are, are, you know, would really, uh, is going to help us to, to create the, the supply chain talent that we need. Anne, your thoughts? Yeah, I thought the talent discussion was, was one of the aha moments of the whole event. Um, and some of your research had showed that talent is the most important factor in predicting operating margin. I thought that was, that was important as well. But I look at it as how do you ignite that passion in people? I think people are, are innately curious, right? So how do you, how do you pull on that and, and get them to look um, outside of what their normal work is, right? We hire people in and we sit them down in front of our ERP and say, here, do planning, right? And this is how we do it. But how do we get them you know, thinking differently and, and really um, trying something new um, I kind of picture having, you know, innovation sessions, right? Get a small team together, uh, diverse backgrounds, right? Give them a problem to solve and give them some time to work on it and, and see what they come up with. Love that thought. Uh, you know, that's what Peggy did and that's what Peter did, right? And uh, what I often see is, you know, an executive gets like this digital transformation kind of bug and, wants to get this big bus of consultants and off we go to implement yesterday's technology. So if that's what you got out of the conference, Anne, I think that's a win. Um, any other conference takeaways? Uh, Cindy? Well, I wanted to stay on the talent thing because this, this was an idea that popped to mind and I'm going to go back to those four headwinds, uh, one of which was education, right? So mm -hmm. Robert was making the point that um, uh, education is so expensive and it's leaving us in debt and that kind of thing. And I, I'm just curious if, uh, given the access to so many free resources, like I can go take Harvard classes online for free, I can become a master in any math problem using Khan Academy. I just wonder if there's a, an opportunity for enterprising people to create an education for themselves that they can get without generating the debt and do we as business leaders have an obligation to consider those enterprising people kind of in the same way as we would someone with a, with a college degree that we're used to hiring? So that was yeah. just a thought that I form, you know, was formulating in my mind about what, what might be one way to alleviate the, at least that headwind and, and make sure that we have a, a diverse pool of 
talent available. You know, one of the things we've worked on with CorpU are next generation online training programs, and it's fascinating to see those roll out and see people kind of have the aha moments on next generation training. So I think we've got to be creative about this uh, because, you know, travel is sometimes restricted, particularly in the back half of the year. And um, I, I have a theory, and I don't know if it will play out in the data and the research, is the more insular organization, the organization that doesn't allow people to network or, you know, go to things like CSCMP roundtables or conferences or uh, participate in cross-functional teams, uh, there's a definite impact on metrics. I, I'm, I'm trying mm -hmm. to play out that hypothesis. I'm not done. We're actually going to be doing some work with APEX and SCMA. APEX, of course, does most of their work in North America, and SCMA does their work in Canada. We're going to be looking at you know, the people and organizations that have allowed people to take certifications and go to conferences and try to find out if yeah, I can validate my hypothesis. But I think the less mm -hmm. insular the organization, the more opportunity for uh, innovation and uh, next generation thinking. And your thoughts? Anything else here? Um, not in that space. I just wanted to give you my takeaways from the conference. I had a few okay, of them. Okay, please. Um, okay. Yeah, one was around the, um, the supply chain can really enable growth, right? It's not just about driving the cost out of the supply chain, but really we can be a competitive advantage and, and make a difference out there. Um, so that was kind of enabling and eye-opening for me. Um, the other one was that if you require an ROI for innovation, that it's not really innovation, right? You, you need to um, not have those rigid rules around the return on investment. Um, in order to allow people to innovate. Um, another one was give people the space and the permission to be innovative. You know, let them try some things. And then if we don't um, try something new, we're going to have the same results, right? So we need to actually get started and do something different. And allow for failure, right? Uh, I remember uh, we had an innovation group when I first started working, and they failed. Uh, it was pretty ugly, you know, we short shipped and unfortunately the leader, you know, took very strong action against them versus celebrating sometimes we fail forward. So mm -hmm. Cindy, your thoughts? Yeah, great point. Um, so you had a, a part of one of your presentations and you talked about having big wings and big feet. Uh, big, mm -hmm. big wings so that you can find the innovative solutions big feet so that you can successfully move forward and implement them. And so I, I just want to advocate a bit for big feet um, and point out that you know a lot of the things we're excited about as far as future technology and innovations and supply chain are going to require that we implement in a wide scale way technologies that do exist today. So digitization and automation technologies that do exist today. So I think there's a that we can start to accelerate innovation, but we've got to have some big feet for a while and make sure that we're, um, you know, using some of these technologies that we have in a in a, in a more broad and uh, way across our enterprises. Yeah, you know, the question that I ask a lot of people is, how do you innovate at the edge and really drive, you know, process evolution at the core? And there's tension between continuous improvement and process evolution and innovation. And uh, it's sort of like stage gate processes and product development so that we look at innovation, whether it's you know Peggy's idea on wearables or Jable's idea on control tower, or Mitch's idea on 3D printing. That's all innovation, and we develop innovation at a process level. And then we need like a stage gate process that is like go, no go, or where does it fit, and how do we evolve it. Unless we have some kind of a process map that allows us to innovate at the edge and do process evolution at the core, then we we have difficulty. And I think that's where the big feet come in. And mm -hmm. it's interesting, you know, when I look at the supply chain to admire research, uh, you know, whether it's Cisco Systems or L'Oreal or Hershey, there are examples where I'm seeing innovation at the edge and then process evolution at the core. Um, and whereas some other organizations, I see that they'll do innovation as a project, but that project may not actually be you know, built into process 
innovation at the center. And I also see that when people are on force mark just for standardization and continuous improvement without embracing innovation at the edge, that they don't really drive the balanced portfolio. So I think that's great to think about is what do those feet look like and what do the wings look like. Uh, I find that when organizations have consistency in supply chain leadership and um, cultural uh, elements at a principle base, then you know you can get that to work. Mm -hmm. uh, any other takeaways? Just uh, again, just uh, congratulations on having such a content-rich uh, presentation or uh, uh, conference. I think that really your, your conference really stands out to me for that reason. That just the amount of of use cases and case studies and, and people you're able to pull together with very content rich, rich, data rich uh, presentation. So well done. Well, thank you oh, so I much. Agree. It's, it's a different well, format, right, than what I've seen in other other conferences, and it really makes you uh, think about things differently. So very good. Yeah. Good. Well, you know, there are lots of conferences, and I didn't want to do a supply chain conference, so I'm glad that you've enjoyed it. So, you know, as we think about going forward and we think about those big feats, we've got to have a hard talk with the CFO. We've got to kind of remove the handcuffs and, like you're saying, eliminate the expectation of a well-defined ROI when we don't know what things are going to look like. Get the stage gate process for uh, innovation going and really embrace those small scrappy teams, uh, let people innovate and partner with technology innovators. It was interesting because in several of the presentations, whether it was the robotics presentation or Peggy on wearables, there was a real spirit of core around innovation with technology innovators versus kind of the buy-sell relationship and, you know, manage the hype cycles. You know, we've got a lot of hype cycles going right now that are overhyping things like blockchain and Internet of Things and cognitive computing and, you know, we got to manage the hype cycle so it's grounded in reality. And I don't think it's one technology that's going to be able to drive this. I think it's many. And, you know, as we think about the path forward, you know, we don't have an equal bell curve of innovators and laggards. In fact, uh, you know, in the last decade, you know, this used to be a distributed normal distribution where we had an equal number of innovators and laggards. And, uh, you know, we've become more conservative, less investment. And so it's our goal to really build a guiding coalition and think differently and drive new outcomes. Because unfortunately, most supply chains are stuck. We're not able to make progress on the balanced portfolio and the effective frontier. And the whole message of the conference is, is it time to take a different path? And I think it is. I think that you know we've got to really say, you know, how do we not just have technology for the sake of technology, and how do we embrace the human factor, and how do we drive uh, true innovation? So, Cindy and Ann, any last-minute thoughts? Uh, I couldn't agree agree more, um, and I and I also really like what Ann said about you know getting the team of people together and letting them try to solve a problem. Um, the the customers that we work with that have the the most innovative ideas are those that support those kinds of models. Okay, Ann, anything yeah, yeah. before we close? And just just to continue with that is you know like kind of your picture here, right? Take a different path. Just be, don't be afraid to do something different. Yeah, and build the organization that allows you to do it. So let's take a few questions for the audience. Uh, Francisco asks, based on all the technology and transformation, what would I say some supply chain roles will disappear and others will be created? I think the master data management role is going to disappear. I think you know pattern recognition, cognitive computing will allow us to sort through data, find patterns, map data, uh, Rules-based ontologies will allow us to change so that we don't need, um, you know, the same kind of uh, analytics team. And I think that uh, our new roles are things like robotic supervisors and uh, wear wearables, uh, you know, experts and ontologists and uh, AI experts and. Um, I think that you know, as we move in those directions, uh, we'll have a lot more roles that are going to be built at those technology innovation interfaces. 
Cindy or Ann, any thoughts here? I think in particular, sorry, Ann, go ahead. I was just going to say the data scientist role, right? If you have more data, the big data, what do you do with that information and so forth um, becomes more prominent and you, you see that people are, are doing less transactional work. Right. Yeah, that's a great point. I'm trying to get my kids to go into data science uh, areas, but so far no takers. Um, I, I think that customer service is going to evolve uh, to be to to be a team that's going to really be able to proactively manage their customers instead of reacting. Um, and we're we're starting to see some of that now. But I think that the more insights that we are able to to use, and the more um, kind of prescriptive analytics we're going to be able to develop because of those uh, you know continued collection of that data, uh, it's really going to be able to transform the way customer service. Uh, responds to their customers. Yes, I agree. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us. And uh, we're going to wrap up our webinar. This is part of our monthly webinar series that we give as part of our spirit of open content to try to build a guiding coalition for change. We will process this webinar and make it available on uh, YouTube and on SlideShare and on LinkedIn. We encourage you to share it with people in your organization. We also encourage you to listen to all the presentations that are now on the Global Summit site and on YouTube and make your own decisions and see where it fits for big wings and big feet. Uh, you know, Henry came back and said, you know, master data management's foundational must have, but you know, I think it changes, Henry, with, you know, master data and cognitive computing and I think we've got to really think about, you know, what is master data. Well, uh, we had uh, Greg said thanks for a good discussion uh, in a good conference and Greg, we missed you and we hope to see you next year. Our conference next year is going to be in Philadelphia and it's going to be about continuing to build the Guiding Coalition. Thanks everyone, and until next time. Helen? Thanks, Laura, and thanks to everyone that joined today. Uh, a few things to share before we end. As mentioned, we will send out the slides and the recording link to everyone within 24 hours, so keep an eye out for that email. Uh, we also encourage you to engage with us on social media by following us on Twitter, Facebook, and SlideShare, and joining our LinkedIn company page. You can find all of this information in the slide deck. Thank you.